Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from wherever you are. Um, we're wel welcoming you to the fourth session in the series of uh, the Climate Finance and Carbon Pricing webinars. And they will be focusing on how to link climate finance to Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. And we have a number of uh, guest speakers that are going to be here with us today to talk about it. And I would like to hand over to my team. Dolphin, but I'll start with, with Dolphin to begin the session. Dolph, uh, I mean, sorry, Jorge, 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 over to you. Yes. Hey, thank you. So, good morning, everybody. Um, I will just briefly introduce um, our first. Oh, hey, you're muted if you're speaking. Oh. Um, we can hear you. No, we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, okay, good. So, yes, uh, as I was saying, I'll introduce um, our first three speakers. Um, so, we have Dr. Sandra Guzman Luna with us. She is um, from Mexico. Uh, she's the founder of uh, and global agenda coordinator of the Climate Finance Group for Latin America and the Caribbean and climate finance consultant for the UNFCCC Secretariat. Um, we have also Peter who is um, the GCF NDA for Kenya. He is also head of climate finance and green economy unit at the National Treasury Kenya. And he's also program coordinator for FLL COA program. Um, and we have, um, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing the name right, but we have Alufonso, uh, who is climate finance expert from Africa Deployment Bank. Um, and I think Maria or um, Dolphin, can you help me introduce our last speaker? And then we can move on to the, to the question session. I think we can give uh, for that, sorry to interrupt, you can give, give each one of the speakers just one minute each to, we can start with Antoine to give us a brief, a brief history of what they do in relation to climate finance or article six and markets. Just, one minute each, please. Well, so I, I, sure, thanks very much. And thanks for, for the opportunity to join the, the session today. Uh, in, in, a, in a nutshell, what uh, I do, I'm managing uh, an association which is called ICRA, which stands for International Carbon Reduction and Offset Alliance, which is a group of service providers in the voluntary market that is dedicated to promoting best practice in carbon management and compensation from companies. So that's the reason for us to exist because this is uh, an unregulated market. So we have a code of best practice and all of our members are audited against the requirements of that code of best practice. So we try to promote private sector voluntary action on climate as much as we can and ensure transparency and integrity in what they do. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, as Jorge introduced me, uh, my work is um, we founded the Climate Finance Group for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, that is an NGO that has been working a lot on transparency and governance uh, related to climate finance, not only at the international level, because we follow a lot of uh, negotiations, but particularly we work at the national level trying to translate uh, those agreements into public um, uh, policy and particularly trying to encourage governments uh, to not only uh, move uh, this analysis of uh, cooperation, but also try to redefine the role of public finance uh, in developing countries. So we work a lot on, on that matters. Uh, maybe Peter? Peter, you're muted. We can't hear you. Yes, just yes. a second. Yes, great. Good afternoon and good morning, colleagues. Good afternoon, Peter, and Great. good morning. Uh, yes, uh, I work in a, a, a different uh, triangular kind of approach where uh, I work at the government, at the National Treasury and Planning, which is shaping the policy on how to ad, uh, advance and access the climate finance, both from the public and private and other sources at the policy level, high level, 
uh, advising the ministers and also the presidency on the same. But I'm also working with the local organization, the Green in Kenya Initiative Trust, where uh, Dolphin, a uh, green champion, is directly also to see how the resources, both from the government and other sources of climate finance, can support uh, local level. But over and above, I've also been uh, working as uh, I've also established the GCF NDA, uh, the National Treasury for the Republic of Kenya since 2013, and seeing how those development of bankable project pipelines are being uh, supported, financed, and also ensuring that accredited entities, both direct and indirect, are working with the local organizations to ensure the flow of climate finance as proposed by the Paris Agreement, Article 9, 6, and the rest of the team. And also, finally now, sorry, it has been long, but now being looking at what has been going on, the government of Kenya through the World Bank, we have, we have started a program called Financing Locally Led Climate Action. So, George, it is, the, uh, yes, Financing Locally Led Climate Action. So F triple L O means that now we are now in the transition and the tra trajectory where we are taking climate finance at the local level in Kenya, which all participants, which all will participate in financing their projects. Now, this is just it's about four months, and it is 300 million US dollars. So climate finance. So colleagues, that is what I do here, and also promote ch green champs uh, like. Uh, Dolphin and a number of them are online uh, under the Greening Kenya Initiative Trust, which I founded in 2009. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very All much, right. Peter. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, greetings from Nairobi, Kenya, and good morning to those in the other part of the world. Uh, first, thanks for having me. My name is uh, Lufunsha Shumarin. I'm the regional principal officer with the African Development Bank. Um, I head the work on climate change and green growth for the bank across the East African region, and which covers 13 countries. And basically the work um, that I lead on with the team is focused on mainstreaming climate change and green growth in all operations within the countries that we work in on the one hand, but also helping countries uh, to develop some of their green uh, policies and programs as well. But more importantly, um, we also work on increasing assets for climate finance, you know, in, uh, in the country, either through capacity building or even through developing uh, bankable proposals to access the estimate funds. And I'm pleased to be here and looking forward to a very productive conversation. Today. Thank you. Good. Uh Thank you very much, uh, Olofunto, and all the other speakers. If you could just jump into the session. So maybe to Peter and Sandra, because you've done a lot of work. It seems you've done a lot of work at an international space, and you're really linked to the international discussions. So if you could basically elaborate, because I know there's some young people out there who don't know even what climate finance is. And we know there's no global definition of climate finance. So if Peter and Sandra, if you could First of all, inform our viewers, the young people who've never heard about climate finance, what this climate finance is. Then, then in relation to the negotiations at COP25, basically inform us what is the global state of climate finance when we left Madrid. And for the final and last question, what is the regional state? Because I've seen you, you both of you do a lot of work at the regional level. What is the regional state of climate finance? Uh, in relation to Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Then last, but I know this is a, very, a lot of questions, last but not least, what is the state of climate finance at the local level, level in reference to COVID-19? So I'd start with either one of you, maybe Sandra. Thank you so much. Yeah, probably one of the things that I didn't mention is that I have been following the negotiations uh, of the UNFCCC for uh, 12 years already and most of the time following climate finance precisely because 
I noticed that uh, finance is definitely one of the, uh, the most important pillars for the climate action. And very few knowledge um, was built on Latin America. And in a way, I wanted to kind of fill that gap in terms of, as you said, not many people know what is climate finance. And, and you, you are right. There is not a definition about what climate finance is or, or, or a universal definition that everyone accepts. However, uh, the Standing Committee on Finance, which is a body that exists on the, uh, under the convention, they have been trying to identify ways to define climate finance in a more operational way. So um, they have been um, analyzing, for instance, uh, biannual, uh, I mean, every two years, uh, the flows that of uh, financial resources that go uh, go from uh, developed countries to developing countries that support the actions related to the reduction of emissions or what we call mitigation and the financial flows that that go to the reduction of uh, vulnerability or increase on, on resilience which uh, we know as adaptation so there is more or less a, an agreement that this um flows that come from developed countries to developing countries are, are, are included in the definition. However, uh, we have been analyzing, there are a, a lot of um, other type of sources that have been also mobilized and that in, in many ways are uh, supporting the climate action such as private flows or even as I was mentioning, even um, national investments like the public uh, expenditure that our countries, developing countries invest are are also part of, of, of the climate finance. But I think a major, major step um, re related to climate finance was achieved uh, with the sign of the Paris Agreement, because in the Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, which is the heart of the, of the agreement, is related to the goals. And countries included in the, in the Article 2.1c, uh, the definition that one of the goals of the Paris Agreement is making finance flows consistent uh, with a pathway towards a low greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. This means that the whole world has to work towards this um, uh, goal of making finance flows uh, consistent with this with this pathway. And, and I, I think key, a key element is that the agreement is not defining which flows. The, the agreement is saying all financial flows have uh, eventually to be uh, uh, consistent with this goal of, of uh, uh, um, uh, reducing emissions and avoid an increase uh, of two, uh, two degrees Celsius in terms of, uh, in terms of the temperature. So this uh, was a, a, a very important step uh, in terms of the definition of what climate finance means. So all financial uh, flows uh, that are uh, related to the, to the achieved achievement of the of the convention and the and the Paris agreement are more or less considering um, considered comma finance a flows. Um, it's very important what you were asking related to the state of the art. Uh, the standing committee, as I was saying, every two years makes an analysis of how much money has been flowing around the world related to climate uh, to climate change. And uh, they have been estimating that the climate finance is increasing along the time. Uh, however, the distribution of this finance is not always equal or is actually very unbalanced. For instance, uh, this analysis that they have been conducting uh, refers that around 70% of the finance flows uh, are dedicated to mitigation actions, while only 25% is related to adaptation, when we actually live in a, in a world where many countries are highly vulnerable to the context of climate change. But still, the adaptation finance is not, uh, uh, let's say, it's, it's not the same uh, amount as the mitigation finance around the world. And it's also very different in terms of the um, allocation regionally speaking for instance latin america is the third uh, recipient in terms of regions of climate finance flows uh, for instance uh, we know that uh, asia and pacific are, are the main uh, recipients of climate finance uh, and, and after africa and after them uh, latin america but uh, in terms of the distribution of this climate finance is even less balanced. For instance, uh, in, Mex uh, for, uh, in Latin America, we have three major recipients of climate finance. For instance, Brazil is the main recipient, uh, Mexico is the second, and, and, and Colombia is becoming like the third, fourth um, country that receives uh, these financial flows. This means that the, the financial uh, flows are very uh, 
very much allocated in, in a few number of countries when we are trying to, to talk about distribution and, and the, the necessity to increase equity in terms of the access of, of financial mechanisms, uh, particularly from least developing countries or even uh, small islands that are also uh, always very, uh, very much needing, needing these resources. Um, Unfortunately, the climate finance debate is um, it's a very complex debate. Uh, you may remember that in, in Copenhagen back in 2009, there was this big commitment to transfer 100 uh, billions of, of, of dollars to, from developed countries to developing countries from 2020. This means that from this year and ahead, every single year, countries have to, to, to transfer 100 billions of, of dollars to developing countries. However, this, um, this perspective seems like it's going to be very difficult to achieve uh, if we only consider public money. So countries are debating how to raise more money, how to not only raise and, and increase the amount of money, but where this money is going to come from, only from the public sources, or we have to include also private money and other type of sources. So, so this is part of the debate uh, in the long term discussion that is taking place in the negotiations, trying to agree uh, to, in a pathway that can define how much money uh, we are going to mobilize from different sources. And, and this is a, and one key point is that uh, this was a, a goal that was established in 2009, 100 and billions. And there is not a specific scientific base to define this goal. But now in 2025, countries will have to define a new goal on climate finance. Uh, and that's why uh, the standing committee is working now. Uh, I'm part of this effort uh, in the needs report, um, developing countries needs report, where we are trying to identify how much money actually the developing countries, or what is what developing countries need in order to fulfill the commitments. And in this conversation, we has to be, um, a, well, a defined in, in the few, uh, in the next few years. Uh, but definitely we, we have to discuss uh, the long-term finance and the innovative sources. And, and I'm going to close this uh, first intervention saying that innovative sources, such as, such as the market, uh, uh, carbon market, or like the carbon price, are some of the discussions that, that we, we have to start uh, thinking, how is this connected with the actual uh, mobilization of climate finance at the, at the global level? And I will, I will uh, bring more uh, uh, elements about the relationship between the carbon markets and the pr uh, carbon prices with the actual mobilization of climate finance um, uh, at the global level and at the national level. So I will I will stop this uh, here for this uh, first intervention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sandra. It, it's actually a lot quite interesting to know that there is a lot of imbalance in terms of our priorities because we have we have you said we have 70 percent uh goes to ad mitigation and another 30 goes to adaptation yet we need adaptation more and i actually like the point where you said even at the regional context there's a lot of imbalance some countries getting uh resources more than the others so in light of that i really like your point just speaking from that, I'd like to, to hand over to Peter to tell us what is the situation in Africa? Basically, is it the same? Is there an imbalance? And from his perspective and his experience, how, how can he define climate finance, having been in the space for, for such a long time? So, Peter, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Sorry, I lost power. And uh, I don't know whether, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Oh, uh, Thanks very much, although I did not hear much from Sandra because of the interruption, but number one, which I concur with, with you, there is no universal definition of climate finance now. But that is not a deterrent on counties to have their own definition because UNFTPC is a global convention, which is a global, a global pact. But that global pact must be unpacked at the local level. And in Kenya, for example, we have defined climate finance as that money which is used or mobilized from public, private, and any other source to finance adaptation, mitigation, and enabling environment. But it is over and above any development or development aspect. So it is X plus one. So it is that X plus one, which is defined definitely to finance adaptation, to mitigate against greenhouse gases, or to develop 
policies, enabling environment that is going to support the deliverable and the access in terms of capacity. It is defined in the Kenyan, the National Climate Finance Policy, seasonal paper number three of, 20, of 2017, as passed by our parliament in 2018. That is the definition in the Kenyan territory, whether it is African Development Bank, where Dr. Ofunso comes from. When you want to finance us, that is how we define it, and it is low. So in the Republic of Kenya, there is no question of we don't have a definition. It is now in law. It is also reinforced in our climate finance, uh, uh, the National uh, Climate Act, uh, Climate Change Act 2016. It is also defined in our medium term expenditure program, MTP3, all along. So in Kenya, we have a definition. So if you don't fill in those definitions, we, the, and that definition is derived from a re agreement, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Kyoto Protocol. So we have that definition. And, and, and now let me dig deeper into the question that you asked. How do we see the regional access? One, Africa has already been, uh, has always been left behind in access to climate finance. Africa missed out within the Kyoto Protocol of this clean development mechanism. The same with joint implementation, which was the first one. The same also with these other mechanisms like uh, uh, joint credit mechanism of, Jap of the Japanese government. And why has Africa not seen increased flows in that? Number one, it is in the complexity of those mechanisms and the local capacity to access information on how to deliver access to climate finance. Two, Climate finance is accessed through the development of the bankable, bankable project proposal, which fits into the definition and key areas components as defined by those funds. For example, the Green Climate Fund has got very specific key, eight key result areas. Those eight key result areas, although they are broad enough, but you have to develop those projects that address uh, those key result areas, renewable energy, both adaptation and mitigation in equal measure. But where is the challenge? The challenge is that Africa, like many other regional small counties in the world, do not have upfront resources to invest in the development of those so-called the bankable project proposal. And when, we, when I say that, and when you ably say that the youth, the young people are missing out, they are missing out, number one, because these institutions have got criteria that requires upfront investment. But the upfront investment do not respond to talks, chats, and movements. They respond to a feasibility, a prefeasibility, a demonstration of that one shilling invested in anything will definitely reduce X amount of tons of carbon dioxide, which would have been emitted anyway when you invest in that. Because Dr. Funso, a bank is a bank. It does business. And every shilling must account for it. And as you... I know Sandra must have told you even when I was off that climate finance, the flow of climate, over 70% of climate finance flowing anywhere has got its origin from the private sector side. The private sector side is very keen on return on business. The public sources, for example, the governments, only provide about 30%. Now, this 30% mainly goes into the other actions, but because the youth are not within the decision-making echelons of the policy systems within the public policy development, they miss out. Because when the systems and the resources being allocated, which is mega, then they are not where, and they are not ready. There is this language of called readiness. If you are not ready to move, you will not move. If you are not ready to fly, you will not fly simply because you don't have a passport, you have not got vaccination, you've not been tested for COVID-19. So even if the planes are 
uh, agreed uh, to come back tomorrow, but a few people will be able to fly. That is how that segment of the community is likely and will continue if we don't shift the mechanism on how to access climate finance, which is very complex. Then we may still cry loud, but there is a, an aura of hope that new initiatives are now coming which is directly supporting the local, the young people. If I dig deeper into the Green Champions and the Green in Kenya Initiative Trust, which we formed, one of the objective of the GKIT was to influence the government policy, train and earmark the policy makers within the government. And that is why I am heading climate finance in a national treasury where an environmentalist has never been there in that strategic position. The real objective is to influence policy. And when they are doing the macroeconomic models, which is determine the fiscal space, then environment and climate change is part of parcel of the parameters of the macroeconomic model, which determine the counties how they will spend their money. And of course, when you go into the decision making wing, there are green champions in parliament to push the same agenda. So nothing is lost. The only thing that we need to do with good work which has been done is simply how to see of the of the 340 of the 343 million uh, billion US dollars which has been flowing globally since 2013 within the climate finance space less than 40% in fact 30% has got its way in africa of that money but if you look at the amount of the money the jeff has been giving over over 20 years period of their 1 billion still less than 40% as even trickle down into the region. If you look at the GCF uh, uh, 9, it was about 8.9 billion, which has been mobilized since during the first replenishment, less than 20% is has moved to Africa. But even that 20% is the bulk of 20, 80% of 20% in Africa is through the indirect access. And you know, when you have indirect access, then a big chunk of up to 10 to up to 10 to 15 percent remains in those capitals for the administrative cost. So when you remove that 20 percent, you deduct another 20 percent of the 80 percent. Africa is lagging behind. Colleagues, I don't want to talk much, but because I know we have our team here, we want to share the knowledge and see how how do we remove the barriers, how do we be ready, and how do we have. The, the long-term climate finance which we are fighting for in the name, the ease of access. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, very you very much, much Peter, for that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter, for that elaborate discussion. It's very interesting to find out that less than 30% of, of, yeah. of climate finance flows that have been there get to the African continent. I think Latin America, you might have the same, almost the oh. same same amount of accrual. I'm basically curious to know where the huge chunk of these resources flow. But before I dive into that, I think I'll hand over to Maria, my colleagues, so that we also get to hear what Alfonso and Antoine mm -hmm. has to say about the discussions that we've already started. So let me hand, out, hand over. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah, oh. Jorge Jorge can take over. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for such thorough explanations on the definition of climate finance, as well as a clear view of the current state uh, of climate finance around the world. Um, now I would like to shift the conversation to Article 6. And for that, I'm going to ask Dr. Sommerin and Mr. Dimmert the following two questions about Article 6. Um, so it describes three different voluntary mechanisms for international cooperation, two market-based and one non-market-based one. Um, so what makes the design of these mechanisms so important as to potentially making or breaking achieving countries and DCs and enhancing private sector involvement? And also, even that it wasn't finalized um, during COP25 as it was expected, um, and now that Glasgow has been moved uh, and pushed to 2021, could Article 6 still help raise ambition and help meet science-based reduction targets? 
Um, we have about 20 minutes um, for both of you to, to answer this question. So maybe we can start with Dr. Um, Samorin, please. All right, thank you, Yuri. Um, thank you, everyone. This is a very interesting conversation. And, and thank you, Vita, again. Uh, we work closely together. And this is something that is very interesting. So before I answer the question on articles, let me say this. Um, the conversation around what climate finance is and what it is not, it's a very challenging one. Um, because you have to talk about climate finance in terms of flows. You know, where is it coming from? Where is it going? You have to talk about climate finance in terms of the use. What is it used for? Fluid. What activity do you have to implement to make it constitute for climate finance? Then you also have to talk about the sources. You know, is it public sources? Is it private sources? Um, as well as you also have to talk about the non-monetary. Um, if you're doing enabling environment, is that still climate finance or must it be project finance? Now, for us at the African Development Bank, I think the starting point is very much around what does this particular cluster of money, what do, what do they do? You know, what do they do on the ground? And if we bring it in a very simple form to any finance that is used to implement climate change adaptation and mitigation projects is considered to be climate finance, then it raises the question that we may have to expand the accounting, the accounting system beyond the traditional flows between developed country and developing country. Because the truth about it is that if we're able to unpack our national budget systems, even in developing country, into actions that, const that contribute to either adaptation or mitigation, we will find out that a lot of our countries themselves are spending money on, uh, on, on climate actions. But oftentimes, we don't call it climate finance. And I think it's very important as well, as we expand the thinking around what the finance is and what it is not, we must be able to um, come to a terms in terms of what do we agree on. So in political science, you call it deliberate ambiguity. And, and basically, you're bringing it together to be able to look into in the pragmatic way of it, as opposed to the theoretical way of defining you know, uh, climate finance. And that takes me into Article 6, because the to set the scene, we must understand that uh, what people call their nationally determined contributions, you know, um, and the priorities in there are extremely, I mean, the activities there are quite huge. If for some countries that have been able to put a cost to it, we're talking about billions of dollars. And if you aggregate it together for a region and like Africa, we're talking about, you know, if, if not hundreds of billions, you'll be running into trillions of dollars. And then the question is, how do you get to finance that? Because the causality is that when you finance the activities that are stated in the NDC, you reach a goal. And what is the goal? The goal is emission reduction um, to a certain level that is achievable. So, but the input that you need is that you need um, resources, financial resources, to implement this priorities in the NDCs in order to achieve that. So what we have under the global mechanism, uh, the Paris Agreement, is an article, Article 6, that tries to look into how do we expand the menu beyond the traditional means. And the whole idea of this menu is that you want something that is more like a voluntary international corporation that is very much promoting an integrated a robust and a balanced approaches together. So you are, if you don't create the space that is a menu of options for countries to be able to implement that, it's possible that we may not achieve those actions. And some of this menu, they may not necessarily be new. Some of them may be actually in existence, but we're not calling that. So by creating a framework that provides the rule of the game to govern every activity or every item on the menu. That is basically, and, and I'm trying to put it in a very limited of what Article 6 is about. I know we can say all the, you know, all the 
theoretical jargons about you know voluntary international corporations that is about trading of emissions from that and that but basically what we're trying to say is and, and and i think we want to as much as possible speak this language to everyone to be able to understand you need a lot of money and you need a lot of tools you need a lot of ideas to be able to implement indices in order to achieve um uh you know the global climate action in doing that you must not be limited to a specific tool. You must not be limited to a specific activity on the menu. You must expand it in a very coordinated way, in a, on a voluntary basis, that it's possible that actions are incentivized on the ground through opportunities that are out there. And, and I think this is basically what it is. And when you have the menu in place, the goal of the menu is basically to raise ambition. So if you have a situation where there are a number of options to the point that wherever you are, whichever country you are, no matter how poor you are, you can find something in the menu that can work for you. And the more, it, and the menu that is based on an incentive system, the more you are able to take on the goals, the, uh, the more the opportunities are at the global level. So, um, I mean, Okay, it, it, this may not be the you know the normal way of explaining Article Six, but basically, for countries, it's not um, it's not a rocket science. We basically need to look into opportunities where you can create a form of corporations between countries, among countries, you know, within a country, in a way that you raise the ambition of achieving um, climate actions in your country. And basically the whole notion of raising ambition is linked to the incentive system around it. And what is the incentive system? You have an opportunity to promote sustainable development by being part of a global mechanism. And the whole idea is that you're localizing a global norm. So you're taking a global norm, you're, being, you're part of it by localizing actions and this global norm has an incentive system for you to do more. If the goal is 50, there's an incentive for you to go to 70. And there's another incentive for you to go to 80. And collectively, that is how you're able to achieve the sustainable development that you need in your country. At the same time, the environmental integrity that we need at the global level. So I'm, I'm going to pause here. There will be time for me. I can come back to it and allow Antonio to come in. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if, Antonio, if Antonio, you would like to continue with um, the question, the same two questions, please. Sure. Thanks, uh, Jorge. And I and I like the approach that was taken to present what our Article Six is and what it can achieve, and how it takes us to greater ambition. Because that that was an unconventional way of, of looking at it. So maybe Jorge, going back to your point about the sub paragraphs that constitute Article Six. Maybe I can talk a little bit more about those and um, and share some maybe some data about what our Article Six could achieve and why it's an important missing piece of the puzzle um, since Katowice essentially and why um, hopefully Glasgow next year will finally deliver Article Six that works for everyone. Um, so yes, it is the basis for voluntary cooperation between countries under the Paris Agreement, meaning that countries can talk to one another and uh, fund reductions where they are the most cost effective, where they can happen the fastest in order to speed up our transition to net zero, essentially, in order to uh, avoid that countries work in silos and achieve their ambition locally, when in fact it can be happening faster through cooperation across countries. At this stage, looking at the current version of NDCs that we have, there's about half, 90 countries um, out of the 190 that have plans to potentially use market mechanisms to reach their climate targets under the Paris Agreement. So they need Article 6 guidance for that because Article 6 governs how those market mechanisms will work. Um, so I just, I would like to take a, a couple of step, steps back 
to um, highlight how we came to talking about Article 6 and, and the difference between Kyoto and Paris. So under Kyoto, we had just 37 countries with top-down targets. Under Paris, we have everyone, 190 countries that have bottom-up pledges, you know, various NDCs, which they designed the, the way that they want with different targets that are formulated in different ways. So in, in some cases, it's not easy to compare NDCs. Um, then under Kyoto, we have the clean development mechanism, uh, which Peter referred to already, and JI as well. Uh, so the joint implementation mechanism, which helped generate carbon credits under uh, the UNFCCC. Now, those mechanisms, the new version of those mechanisms is, is what Article 6 is going to deal with. So that's the successor of the CDM in a nutshell and other non-market cooperation. And while under the, the Kyoto Protocol, there wasn't much of an issue with accounting because most of the credits were created in host countries that didn't have a climate target under the Kyoto Protocol. This time under the Paris Agreement, because each country has a target, you need to ensure integrity in those transfers that will take place from one country to another. That, that needs corresponding adjustments, which, well, is the way that it's formulated in Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which is essentially double entry bookkeeping, an accounting adjustment to make sure that, you know, the host country that will support the um, mitigation activity will transfer that reduction to a donor country and that both countries do not claim that reduction. So it's just, it's all about ensuring that there is no double counting of, of the mitigation. Um, so yes, there is article 6.2, subparagraph two is guidance for reporting of those internationally transferred mitigation outcomes. So ITMOs, which is the technical jargon um, which will require those accounting adjustments. Then there's Article 6.4, which is essentially the emissions mitigation mechanism um, to issue those new units building on CDM and NJI. And then there's Article 6.8, which is the work program for non-market approaches um, to in sort of advance cooperation between countries without involving the transfer of units, so those ITMOs, which I mentioned. And there's great potential for Article 6. Um, a lot of conditions for that potential to materialize, but there's great potential because it could allow for a great variety of different approaches. It you know, enables countries to use various approaches, local, international approaches to mitigate um, emissions and achieve their NDC. Countries are free to cooperate on their NDC achievement. And they could establish, so Article 6 would establish the framework for how carbon pricing policies globally could link as well. Uh, I mean, at this stage, it's very local, like, you know, the European emissions trading system linking with the Swiss emissions trading system. Uh, in North America, you have the Californian um, cap and trade system linked with the cap and trade system in Quebec. So they're, they're really regional uh, linkages, but you could imagine that these policies expand um, in the future. So theoretically, that could that could achieve a lot more reductions. Um, and then I think you could, you, Article 6 could be used by countries to create carbon clubs. You know, certain countries that want to make fast progress could use guidance from Article 6 to set up their, their climate policies. And then, as mentioned before, I think the main potential is that it drives mitigation at the lowest cost in, in the fastest of ways uh, so that we can all transition to, um, to net zero as soon as possible, essentially to avoid the worst. So that, that's the greatest potential. And AITSA, um, so that's the, the mother association uh, that, that, is, um, that I work for, has conducted some research back in 2019 on the economic potential. So they've done some modeling work with the University of Maryland and so just to, I just want to give a couple of figures to make this more concrete, but by 2030, um, Article 6 could potentially um, increase ambition by nine gigatons annually, but also reduce overall emission, um, uh, the cost for reducing those emissions by 
almost 300 billion. So that these are really significant figures. There's a lot of conditions for that sort of, uh, you know, cost reduction to materialize and for the ambition to be there. But I think it's really important information to remember. And that's why Article 6 is the missing piece from the Paris Agreement rulebook in Katowice and a really important one um, because it can really speed up uh, progress um, under the Paris Agreement. The, there's a number of issues to solve, which I won't get into because I, I guess I'm running out of time. But I think the way forward is this year and, and next year, hopefully we'll see rules adopted at COP26 in Glasgow. This is not stopping Article 6 pilots and international cooperation uh, across countries to, you know, happening from happening. There's there's a lot of countries that are already building Article 6 pilots, mainly building on the Article 6.2 text um, to, you know, go ahead and develop mitigation projects and to transfer those. So, um, you know, to use a local example, because we're based in Switzerland, Switzerland is working with a number of countries um, to essentially use Article 6 and deliver, help increase ambition under their NDC. Um, but really, I think that 6.4, uh, the, the new version of the CDM, if I may say, is probably the, uh, the biggest missed opportunity at the moment. But there's, there's much more work to be done to ensure there's enough integrity so that the mechanism can achieve what it's meant to do. So, yeah, I think we can only encourage countries to really get their act together in Glasgow next year. But I think that a lot, of, a lot is happening already using the draft Article 6 text that uh, emerged after, after Madrid six months ago. So I think I'll leave it at that for, for now, and maybe we can come back to that later. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for speaking, uh, Antoine, and also uh, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Funso. Now, I, 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 I'm like I'm really excited by the way this is going. The the discussion is going because previously we had just been doing slides and and not having time to actually interact um, with key experts. And firstly, I wanted to show that I'm wearing the um, Youth for NDCs uh, T-shirt that we did. Uh, and, and it got like a lot of young people from developing countries talking about how NDCs can be enhanced in their countries. And I wanted, I want to maybe deviate a bit from the question that I'm supposed to be asking all of you and, um, and ask the questions about emissions reductions projects, which has been a bone of contention during the negotiation at, um, at the, uh, in Spain last year. And to also ask, um, all of you is um, like, for example, doctor from AFDB, you said that countries in developing, well, developing countries are already um, doing climate action projects and they may have already started enhancing their ambitions, but are not actually uh, reporting it or it's not being recorded properly. How can we improve that so that it's reflected in the upcoming NDCs that are supposed to be submitted? And then to the rest of you is um, how do you think that Article 6, especially with regards to the emissions reductions uh, projects and the uh, roadblock around um, those negotiations, how can, how can that be resolved? to prevent the double counting and also like the transparency, the fear of not being transparent for member states and the private sector. All right, thank you. Let okay. me go forward. Oh, okay, Peter, please, Peter, please go. Peter, please go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, good, I, I will be very short because uh, thanks for the able description from Antonio. And Jog, I don't know, Martinez, if that is the right name? Yes. The, the, the only thing with Article 6, because at the, Article 6, as ably and uh, eloquently said, is the key and the cog for the realization of the NDCs on the, on the other side. You know, we have two NDCs, but we also have NAPs, uh, National Adaptation Plans. Many African countries' priorities is NAPs. But let me not go there, because I know you did not raise the issue of NAPS. But when we go to the adaptation, number one, 
the Article 6 has got a challenge. A challenge that because during the, uh, the Madrid COP25, Rule 16 was applied. When Rule 16 is applied, it means we are starting from the zero ground. And that zero ground, it's very, very, it's very, very intricate now with the emergence of COVID-19, where you see most of the developed parties and they uh, are shifting their economic and support goals. And once that takes place, and with the suspense or with the pushing of the Glasgow next year, and because the movement and the negotiations or the intercessions are really not taking place now, then it means that the most, uh, Article 6, which is really very good, because the rules have not been really defined, because in Madrid we were at a good stage where negotiations or compromise could have been reached. But because of the stakes and the ambition, it was not reached. And when it was not reached at that level, we start from ground, uh, ground zero. Yet, as I said, 70% of the climate finance on the mitigation uh, uh, side is supposed to come from the private sector. This is the private sector driver because the, the private sector requires rules which guide the market. The market sensitivity, the market sounding, based on long-term global and regional and national policies, is very strong key indicator on how the markets, the Californian market, the European uh, emission trading scheme, the Nairobi Stock Exchange, the Nairobi Securities that we are working now to trade on our carbon, are getting signals just like what happened to when the Kyoto Protocol was due to expire, yet there was no a new replacement for that, then the market simply retreated because they are not, market requires predictability. And when there is no predictability with a signal like uh, Rule 16 within the global negotiation, then we need to be very honest and say, yes, on the, on the market side, the regulated market side, we have a problem. But on the unregulated, uh, the voluntary market, that is now where actions can be starting pulling, as Anthony uh, Dimat said, that smaller projects now can start moving in. Because the ma regulated market simply will require those market, market principles, market rules, market pricing. Finally, because of time, I'm a part of a... Uh, Global Coalition for Financements. I'm a shopper with the Helsinki principles, and we are within the climate, uh, the finance minister's climate action, which is determining those rules. While there is a lot of advancements and uh, advancements that uh, within the within the coalition of finance minister and also the European International Platform for Sustainable Finance, those are global actions that are trying to push and consolidate the access. But without the Glasgow, there will be no time to get into near where we were. Post Glasgow, we still don't know where we are going. The regional caucuses on the, uh, the long-term climate finance, their report, long-term climate, which was approved, but now needed to come up with updated for the ambition. There are still a lot of challenges, and I think uh, this, this we will really need to see how. So over to you, uh, Dr. Thank you, thank you, Peter. And and this this keeps getting very interesting. Um, let me say this quickly. Um, as an African Development Bank, we we took a quick look at the INDCs. So, what countries submitted in September 2015, and to just have a quick look into, you know, a quick analysis in terms of what are, how do you cluster the areas of interest, the priorities stated. And we see find that despite adaptation being the, you know, the priority of the African continent, most of the projects that are expressed in the in the indices were very much mitigation. And then when you combine that together with the fact that more than almost seventy percent of them are conditional upon international support, then if you just bring that together alone, you get a sense that. Um, 
Article 6, the discussions around Article 6 are very much hijacked by the intent for mitigation. And, 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 and I think a, in a way we've been able to say this. And I don't think it's necessarily bad. I think it's very important to understand that, you know, um, we need to increase the mitigation ambition in all our countries. But what he means again is that as mitigation may be very enticing to the business community, but you see, the business community is first driven by business sense before it is driven by ecological or environmental, you know, you know, demand. And I think what is important is how do we begin to help our African countries? Keep in mind that despite all of them saying adaptation is important to us, when you unpack the projects and you put a cost to them, 60 to 70% still comes down to mitigation in terms of um, expected flows of resources. And when you combine that together with the fact that, you know, this is conditional upon support, you know, and then you begin to see that we must begin to look critically into how would African countries benefit from um, Article 6. And that's why I said, consider it to be a menu. And that's a very good thing about it. It itself is not perfect, because if every time you see any document on Article 6, you will always see something called, if you always see a caveat, like if properly designed. And I think that fear of if properly designed is there, because if it is not, there, there's a reason why the Kyoto Protocol thing was not successful. There's a reason why Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol favored mo, uh, uh, a segment of the global uh, population much more than others. So it's very important to make sure that the design on the one hand is as, um, without compromising the integrity of the framework, you see make sure that the design gives rooms for inclusivity. It's important that a country like Burundi, no matter how poor it is, must be able to find a place within the Article 6 framework. And I think the work that we need to do um, as partners for us as a development financial institution is to begin to help them. And I like what Antonio said. He said, you know, this is a bit of a bottom-up aggregate as opposed to um, what happened in the, um, in the case of Kyoto Protocol. And you know, that bottom-up approach, we need to help countries to be able to understand what are their realities and what are the things that need to be put in place. What institutional strengthening mechanisms do you need, you need to have in place? You know, Peter said something of what they call readiness. And it's important how that simple word is yet a very complicated and very complex word when it comes to operationalizing readiness. We live in a world today where those who have money, they claim they cannot have good bankable projects, especially in Africa. And those who have projects in Africa say they cannot find money. In the same ecosystem, you are having a mismatch between the demand side and the supply side. And there's a need for us to be able to invest in a lot of facilitative modalities to bring these two together. So on the one hand, we have an article that gives us a bit of a level playing field and a bit of a global market where you can come and trade. But again, if you don't design it such that, you know, there are issues about, is it double counting? There's are issues about fungibility. If I'm good in forestry, our forestry, if I'm good in reducing emissions from deforestation, is that the same as a clean energy in another part of the world? And those are things that are too very complex. But what I can say, and I don't want to highlight too much of problems, what I can say is the work is to appreciate the work that needs to be done, particularly in Africa, to help our countries to understand what are your unique comparative advantage. From this menu we talk about, what do you think is, po is possible to work best for you? And how do you begin to put your house in order? How do you begin to build the skill set that are necessary? The notion of bankability, you'll be shocked to know that when an investor says, I'm looking for bankability, it may not be the same as, as, a, as a project uh, proponent. Uh, and, and we must be able to harmonize this thinking in a way. I don't want to monopolize this, but I think it's very important. As we think about this creation of a global mechanisms, we must think critically into its implementation at the national level, at the grassroots level, 
how do we begin to take that and not scale it up in, in, the, in the global design? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Olufunso. Uh, I'm sorry to jump in. I wasn't next, but there's something you've, you've said. Uh, we, we need to we need to appreciate what needs to be done, and the way you put it, we need to look at, for example, Africa. We we have adaptation needs more than mitigation needs. We need to sort of custom make uh, this these initiatives to fit into our context, basically. So there's this one burning question. There's something Peter said earlier. I'd like to go back to it and circle just around it. Peter talked about indirect access and direct ac access. So he said indirect access account for around 70% of the climate finance flows and the direct access around 30% of finance flow. How does this indirect access come down to, to climate financing, come down and affects markets at the regional and also the global aspect. So maybe Olufunso, Peter, and also Sandra, I'd like to hear how that could potentially affect this issue of markets at, at, at international, regional, and local grassroots. And, and also before they answer, we have some questions from the audience, from Rebecca. Um, if they could also touch on those, I will broadcast them on the screen so you can all see that. Is, is that for me or for Sandra? I think anyone can answer. Dr. So I can jump in and then we can all can participate because um, so uh, I, I would like to go back to a couple of points. Uh, the first one, uh, I think it's important to, to have this differentiation when we talk about Article 6, as Antoine was saying, because if we go back to, to the protocol, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, we have to think in the scenario that we were having at that time when, when developing countries didn't have obligations and, and developed countries find, um, found a way to accelerate the reduction of emissions, not necessarily transforming their economics, but trying to, to uh, invest technologies and, and other projects in developing countries as a way to help them to leapfrog uh, in terms of development uh, and try to then help them to keep growing, but in, in a different way, as well as re reducing emissions. Uh, and that was the idea of the CDM, uh, like trying to invest in developing countries to, to receive like a transformational way to, to do things and at the same time um, reduce emissions to come as part of their commitments. But uh, what we have now is, of, of course, uh, uh, a moment when all the countries should be part of the reduction of emissions. Of course, not all the countries have the same responsibility in terms of emissions, but at the end of the day, uh, many countries um, that are part of the developing world are now uh, quite uh, major em emitters of greenhouse gases. So my colleagues were saying that, for instance, many de developing countries are already doing things uh, locally and uh, nationally, but we don't have to forget that many of our countries are still also making an, uh, major investments on fossil fuels. No, in, in our, uh, So we cannot just uh, have this romantic idea that developing countries are doing things on climate change because we are also experiencing lots of developing countries keeping these um, uh, the same style in terms of development. And it's something that we have to cut uh, from, from the, structurally. In that sense, I, I think uh, definitely Article 6, uh, it's a way to to try to differ, to create alternatives and and other mechanisms to reduce emissions, but I couldn't I couldn't say that is the key or the silver bullet because definitely we have to consider that we have to play with a tools uh, the, a set of tools where we can um, redefine for sure the the ways uh, in terms of how we are doing things in the different sectors, and of course the carbon market is a piece of it. But I think um, I, I think there are three key elements that we have to consider in terms of, of on the negotiations related to Article Six. The first one is, of course, transparency. Transparency because we have to define who are the players, what are the rules, 
and if we are all going to play with the under the same rules. Because as you know, in the negotiation, certain countries want their own rules. For instance, the, Brazil wants to just bring the CDM structure to the to the Article 6 as it is. And it's something that cannot, cannot happen because colleagues are saying here that CDM was successful. And I disagree on that because CDM was successful in terms of transferring certain technologies and certainly mobilizing finance. But if you analyze the deep concept of reduction of emissions, I don't. I disagree with uh, with the approach of the CDM because you cannot prove that the CDM was actually successful with the actual goal that the CDM was 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 following. So, how we can think that Article Six is going to be successful if you have the same structure that the CDM? I I I wouldn't think that. But the point is also, in terms of the carbon market, you now have different uh, categories. Even you have voluntary markets now. And, and you have to play um, in, in, an, in an sphere with, we, you have to define, are you gonna play under the rules of the convention on, or are you gonna play outside the rules of the convention? Because article six is quite tricky because it's, it's kind of allowing uh, the, the markets happening bilaterally, uh, but at the same time it's trying to, to complete a carbon market like a global carbon market and, and it's not necessarily uh, establishing like a set of rules that can uh, be uh, obviously it's it's what we are trying to to discuss what are those rules that that have to be uh, agreed and 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 in this case it's a matter of governance because if you have voluntary markets and then you have regional carbon markets and then you have a global market and then you have this and then you have that obviously everyone wants their own rules and this is a major, major, major problem under in, in the negotiation of the of the UN Triple C because, uh, for instance, uh, the the, ar the article says is suggesting that the carbon markets uh, or the uh, can help countries to fulfill uh, the the commitments established uh, in the in the NDCs, but as you know, the NDCs are also um, elaborated in a very different ways. No, some countries have goals in terms of energy efficiency. Other countries have goals in terms of uh, economic wide perspectives. Other countries have a specific sectorial targets. So, and, and these um, uh, uh, adjustments that the Article 6 is suggesting is something that has a problem from the root because the indices are not made in the same way. So it's, it's, it's the type of things that we have to uh, harmonize in the process to actually uh, think in a, in, a, in a global format that can be suitable for everyone. And of course, you have the integrity problem. This is not only about environmental integrity. This is environment, it's a matter of social integrity. And the CDM was not adequate on environmental and social integrity. So we have to learn from those lessons, but we, have to, we cannot repeat, repeat the same mistakes. And it's the type of things that we have to discuss in the context of the negotiations, because now we have to bring the issue of human rights and all of these discussions in the context of the negotiation, because we cannot just believe oh, that Article 6 will save us all from the, the climate emergency. It's not true. It's one instrument. And of course, has to be well designed, and all the countries have to be uh, in the same in the same um, agreement uh, uh, and have to play with, with under the same rules. Because if they are not willing to do so, then you are going to create only a big bubble of, of reduction of emissions. That the only thing that will produce is an increase in the emissions, and we are all just done. No, so I think we have to be very careful in this discussion. That don't really think that the, the carbon market will save us. But of course, we can. We have to design something that will help to the community to advance in certain um, in a track uh, of the discussion. Um, but always, always, always uh, in this uh, transparency, governance, and integrity uh, rules, because what you don't want is not only double counting. What you don't want is to increase emissions in this uh, in this um, kind of idea that uh, because. If I if I'm in, uh, exchanging um, my my carbon with a country, let's say Japan, and and they reduce emissions, if there is not a, 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 a global counting, who is going to avoid me to sell these emissions to somewhere else? No, and 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 because black market exists everywhere, so we have to be very very critical about these mechanisms as well as propositive. But but then then I don't think that 
that is the silver, the silver bullet that we have to be um, considered, but rather we have to be very pushing towards a more integral perspective that starts uh, to define rules that everyone will follow. Otherwise, we will create uh, a, a, an additional problem that will be even uh, worse than we are at the moment. Yeah, it's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a thorough answer, Sander. I very much appreciate the perspective on how this could actually go wrong and that it's not a silver bullet. Um, I think what we can create is what, what's called um, hot air. I'm um, just make it seem like in accounting that we're reducing emissions when we're really not. So that's that's a big issue. And I think I wanna uh, direct the this, uh, I mean, in the interest of time, I would like to add this question and direct it to uh, Antoine. Antoine um, I think um, from the Kyoto Protocol and to the Paris Agreement, how has um, climate finance or how have market design uh, changed and what can we or what have we learned already um, from market designs um, to make it work, to maximize the results and materialize uh, the results that you were talking about earlier, which I think is important to put them into context. Um, the 9 billion gigatons that you talked about could be um, 20%, 25% um, of the total emissions we have today. So what have we learned in this past 30 years, maybe 20 plus years uh, from market designs to make this happen um, the right way and not go um, south as Sandra was, was saying that was possible? Thanks for the question. And I, I think the, this issue of hot air and proper accounting is at the center of everything. Uh, the approach that Brazil is taking, which simply wants a transfer of business as usual of CDM, of the CDM world under the Paris Agreement creates that hot air and would have worked and spent, you know, for such a long time and spent so much energy, energy designing a system that achieves nothing in terms of mitigation. Um, so clearly to me, that accounting question is the center piece. There's other pieces like share of proceeds uh, in the host countries, which are highly debated. Um, and it's all just a tool complementing adaptation measures, finance, uh, climate finance measures, and actual proper decarbonization, right? Uh, locally by, by countries. So it's just a tool. It has great potential, but it's a tool that needs to, to be designed uh, accurately in order to be efficient. Um, what I'd like to, to, to say a few words about is uh, just um, there was this reference to the voluntary carbon market and how it can help, but also if it leaves in a separate world that doesn't ensure harmonized accounting, it could lead to, to hot air. I think to offer a slightly different perspective, I would say that we need to incentivize that voluntary action across the private sector. I think that there's, we've, we've seen last year and earlier this year before COVID hit that we've seen so many pledges uh, to net zero, right? Uh, whether it was airlines, large corporates, I think the last um, significant example that I can think about is Apple last week making that net zero pledge using carbon removals. Um, so carbon sequestration whether it's technological sequestration or, or biological sequestration, we'll see, but um, it's clearly not avoided emissions. So it's trying to go a bit further than uh, what the market has been about to date, which is avoiding emissions or reducing emissions. But I, I think there's a great role for the voluntary uh, action across the private sector to help take us further quickly. Um, we wait for Article 6. We'll wait, you know, at least another 18 months. Who knows what the COP presidency might be able to achieve? There's a lot of diplomatic efforts taking place at the moment to make it successful. But who knows? Maybe we won't get an, a functional Article 6. So I think that there is a voluntary market that has been operational for the you know, last 15 years. There's transparency. It's robust in terms of measurements, uh, reporting verification. Um, there, are, there are robust standards with clean and clear registries publicly available. And I think that we need to encourage um, 
the private sector to continue investing in mitigation and adaptation projects because oftentimes these projects deliver carbon reductions but also contribute to uh, some of the SDGs so they have socioeconomic impact beyond just the carbon reduction. Um, of course for them this has got to complement a sound science-based decarbonization strategies. The compensation of emissions has got to be the compensation of residual emissions once you are on an IPCC aligned uh, trajectory to, to reduce your emissions in line with the Paris Agreement. But I think, I think that it's a really critical tool to use to drive additional mitigation. We have the infrastructure in place. There's so, such a variety of projects in uh, developed countries, uh, developing countries, least developed countries, you know, whether we're talking about uh, forestry projects or waste management projects, uh, renewable energy projects, um, you know, blue carbon uh, cookstove, clean cookstove projects. I think that a lot of people agree these projects are of great value. They wouldn't happen otherwise without private sector finance, clearly, because it's not a priority locally, which is understandable. So I think we need to incentivize that action. Of course, the private sector will make a claim on the basis of those carbon credits. But I think it's 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 a it's a tool that's available now that delivers reductions today. Um, so we really we should use it. We should make sure that it fits in the grand scheme of things when it comes to accounting under Article Six. Um, but it, it's really a great opportunity, I think, to to look at. Um, so I know I know I it's a bit of a digression here because the question was about what have we learned to date. Um, but I think this is one of the things that, that we should learn is that these emission reduction projects have, have great value to address the time gap, the emissions gap, the finance gap, clearly. Um, and, and the accounting piece uh, to me is, is the elephant in the room. We need to make sure that there is integrity, that everything is accounted for in a registry that is publicly available and that some of the negative impacts that some projects had under the CDM are addressed around leakage, around human rights, uh, around share of benefits. But that's something uh, that hopefully will be dealt with by uh, Glasgow next year. So I'll leave it at that for now. So thank you very much. Thank you much, Antoine, for that very elaborate uh, discussion. Uh, maybe we take a question from our audience. Uh, there's a question uh, for Peter from the audience. If you could just uh, broadcast it. OK, from Rebecca. I hear Africa has a least recipient fund for climate finance. Peter mentioned the issue of readiness. Is the easing access a way out? What what are the African models that will enable access? So, Peter, that's a question from Rebecca to you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. One is uh, readiness is very important because you have to have policy and the instruments that is required to enable you to access the, the funds. The fact that Africa has been receiving little resources from the fund means that one, either there are no requisite policies and legislative framework that supports the enabling environment, that creates enabling environment or incentive that uh, Antonio was talking about, incentives about long-term policies. Then the readiness is also meaning that you have the capacity, the lot of requisite capacity for the coming up of these proposals because the flow of climate finance in Africa is climate finance is access to rural development over potential. It is also access to having uh, the, the technical capacity that is able to enable translate those key results areas, the aid and the priority areas and the carbon. And also uh, when the in, in, in the whole process within the readiness, there is this transparency and accountability, the paradigm shifting, and the, the paradigm shifting, which is 
the requirement, business and usual within this designs of these funds require that things are done differently. And uh, uh, tracking, recording, tagging, and showing critically what is going on is very, is very, very key in accessing the, those resources. But the other part of it that GCF and other funds like Jeff Adaptation Fund, the least develop, uh, developed counties fund, climate investment, all those also require the so-called co-financing. Those co-financing either have to come from the public sources. Then if you look at the countries in Africa as uh, over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of uh, declining uh, development assistance, the economics, although there has been growth of between three to 5%, but those growths are not translated into the actual readiness cars that will enable those governments to co-finance such projects so that attract uh, the, the, the more flow. Uh, then she also said that although the readiness does not mean the ease of access in a straight line, readiness means that you are having all the whatever, what is most of the things that are needed. So you need the support over and above to enable you move. For example, in terms of Kenya, where we are. Kenya, we can say that over the last, since 2009, the government has been very busy using the government little resources to ensure that the legislative frameworks, the capacity, the establishment of the climate change action plans, units, or uh, also uh, climate change funds are in place in such a way that when you are now going to access all the, the resources from outside, they complement the public sources finance. Very, very important. And then the other aspect is also that if the county is not ready, then the, the indirect and the direct comes in. So now other people will be ready for you and bring for you proposals which respond to them. And of course, as, as we have been discussing here, you know, the NDCs are already been submitted. Every county can read and know what your targets is. But now if I know that this is what is your target and I can have that money then, then you mean that you are mobilizing that resources in an untargeted area. So yes, we need to see how we can enhance Africa access to this global financial system. But two, we also need to see how, because if you look at the international flow, and if you look at, if you quantify what the African government has been financing the climate change, it's bigger than the inflow. We have data in Kenya, where, where we have tracking. The Kenyan government is spending more than any development, including World Bank, in any given year. But when the story, the narrative, which is given outside there, that we are supporting you, it is not true that the climate flows is too much from outside. If you analyze and tag and define climate finance at a country level, you will find that counties are doing more than what is accessible to those ones. I have the data, I have the information, and I can prove it, number one. So what is coming outside is less. What is coming from, the, from that is much. But that is now contrary to the convention. Because the convention, as uh, Dr. Fonzo said, one, Ambition, ambition, increasing the ambition to enable us reach below 1.5 is premised upon support. But that support is supposed to be through the long-term climate finance. That long-term climate finance and those mechanisms that are being discussed within Article 6 are the critical areas which the partners are not agreeing on. And that is what is also coming in with the, the reporting and the disconnect between what we say and what we say. So to solve that problem, we are not going to cry. We have formed Africa National Designated Authorities or GCF Climate Focal Points in the entire Africa after. So we are going to sit ourselves as African GCF NDAs, discuss our own priorities, where we will finance it in terms of the requisite flow, uh, requisite sizable predictability, the sustainability, and that source which we know where it needs to come. Because you can climate is uh, climate uh, climate financing and responding to 
mitigation and adaptation in equal measure as provided for under the Paris Agreement requires long-term planning. That long-term planning goes with the long-term budgeting. Long-term budgeting is linked to long-term climate finance. Long-term climate finance is linked with support and enabling environment. So when all these pieces are not moving together, one is delay, one is right, then Africa cannot access sensible flows as proposed within the NDCs. I rest my case. Thank you, Peter, for that very strong message. I think you've dropped the message deep home to the grassroots at this point. Uh, to we, we are just about to conclude. So we have a final question uh, from the audience to Dr. Olufunso. So there's a there's a one of our audience, Rebecca, has a question. So if you can broadcast it, uh, Dr. Funso. I hear you're saying Article 6 is one of mechanisms to mobilize finance as a way to raise ambition. Sounds easy, straightforward for parties to adopt. Now, why was it a blocking stone in Madrid? So, Rebecca uh, Olufunso, from Rebecca, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, such a brilliant question. Thank you very much. But Rebecca, I'm sure you're listening. Actually, Sarah, um, this is Sandra, sorry, one of the speakers, already um, provided a lot of answers to speak to the question. But let me just rephrase what she said, and, and I think this is very important. The game of designing uh, a, 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 a rule that applies for ev to everyone across the world, it's really hard. Especially, it, it could be easier in trade, but when it comes to issues of climate change, it's extremely hard. Now, then in, during COP25 um, in Madrid, it was even much more challenging around Article 6 for a number of reasons. Um, let me say this, uh, in addition to what my colleague said, what Sandra said, I mean, Sandra talked about you know, the issue of transparency, the rules of the game, who the rules are allow the players, who is the player, and what kind of rules. Is this rules, is it, you know, is the same across board for everybody? But let me also tell you the fact that it's challenging when you're trying to create rules that can match the ambition that you are instigating. So the rules that can match or provide the space for that ambition to be a reality, it's where the challenge is. Because then what you have to do is that, you know, you may have to come to a bit of a lower, com the lowest common denominator across the board. And then you have some, uh, some powerful countries who may not necessarily want that. I mean, and, and I agree with Sandra, think of Brazil and India who are saying, we have excess credit from CDM days, can we bring them into this? You know, and everybody's trying to say, no, we're trying, this is a new field entirely, we're starting from zero. And then others are like, well, no, it's not another climate that we're trying to change. I mean, that we're trying to reduce this change. It's the same climate and all that. And then you have a situation where some of the conversations within Article 6 are extremely technical. Carbon market issues are extremely technical. Issues about reference, uh, baseline reference, issues about additionality, issues about uh, double counting. And when you consider that across different sectors, from energy to agriculture, to waste management, there, there are a lot of technicalities in it. Yet, when it comes to decision making, decision making is very political. And so you are having a challenge with a technical issue this being discussed in a very politically charged environment. And I'm sure you can all really tell that that itself is very problematic. So, I, and I think the further we're talking, we'll keep talking more, we will come to, because we have to find a solution, we will come to a conclusion. But it's not, um, there's a reason why, it, you know, it, it's been a challenge because indeed we're trying to do something that is very tough. And I agree with Sandra as well, this is not, it can raise the ambition level, it can, you know, help us to get there, but this is, 
this is not the final solution. This is not the only solution. And itself is not a silver bullet. So I'll keep it there in the interest of time. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Lufunso. Yes, so I... I <laughs> Maria, go ahead. Okay, uh, so this question is from Patrick and it's it's uh, directed to both Sandra and Antoine. It's about uh, Corsia under Article 6 and they're asking um, how, has, how has the reduction in flights because of the COVID-19 period, how has that affected the emissions reductions under Corsia and how can we maintain this trend um, once the once the once the countries have opened up mm -hmm. Anton, do you want to go ahead sorry I, yeah i'm i was on mute apologies uh yeah very quickly it's you know, of course, disappointing that the pilot phase of Corsia essentially won't see any demand if for for um, units that are eligible. Um, Corsia took some time to be put in place, and we, you know, finally had a list of agreed units to be used by airlines. And um, before COVID hit, uh, I think there was enough clearly supply. Uh, in, in the market, uh, given the wide range of units that were eligible to be used by airlines, including CERs. Um, but because COVID, you know, hit hard on airlines, and I think the industry doesn't anticipate a return back to normal until 2024, which is effectively after the end of the, the pilot phase, there will be little demand. And um, I think for the next three years, essentially, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a three delay for action across across airlines. Um, you know, now IKEA has made a decision on this last month, and I think the, the new baseline will be, uh, you know, later in the future in 2023. So from there, um, you know, let's hope that finally um, this can take off. So apologies for the pun. Um, but yeah, of course, who could anticipate what's what's happening now? Um, it's, it's, it's an industry that is very, very affected um you know maybe, maybe a mix of change of habits and a mix of uh less routes less planes will 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 have a, a, an even more significant impact in the future um but it, i don't want yeah it's hard to to say um you know where all, all of this is headed what we can say for now is of course um we won't see any demand for from airlines can I, can I just uh, comment a couple of things uh, about this? I, th I think Corsi is one of the, the great examples of how uh, when you establish certain models and, and certain rules, uh, and if you don't have this global efforts that, to that work uh, together towards those, uh, let's say, goals, it's really difficult to, to comply with, with, with certain mechanisms. I agree that, that Corsia will, will, have, will struggle after the pandemic because of course now like the airlines lost so much that now they, they will mainly, mainly redefine certain goals or, or, or delay, no? which is uh, in, in any case uh, very bad. But I, I want to also to highlight two elements that I would like to, to kind of uh, emphasize about the context of the negotiations of Article 6. Let's, let's, uh, let's remember that, for instance, one of the things that we would like to see uh, if Article 6 is well designed, uh, we have to think in how Article 6 will benefit those that need it. And know, like, because remember that when the CDM started, very few countries benefit, benefit a lot of CDM. For instance, China, Brazil, uh, Mexico, I mean, the, the, the usual suspects, let's call it. Um, so what you don't want to create with Article 6 is just another bubble where now China, it's a mayor emitter, and now all the, the benefits of the carbon market will go to China. So we have to be very careful about um, how the benefits are allocated and how the rules are established. Otherwise, we will see, again, um, mobilizing these resources and this support to economies that should be actually integrating these issues uh, at, the, at the 
planning and national level. So I'm talking about Brazil, I'm talking about China, that they have major, major contributions in terms of emissions now. And, and, and so you don't want to repeat that model. No, you, you have to think in Article 6 as the possibility to, to extend the benefits, to create a proper model where globally you can exchange benef uh, creating benefits in, in different, the different range of, of countries, trying to globally mobilize efforts to reduce emissions and avoid, of course, China and Brazil, they concentrate a lot of emissions, but by now they should be responsible also to invest their own money to, to reduce emissions and not only waiting for this um, other uh, private or international cooperation to, 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 to help them. You know, they don't need help as such. Uh, so I think we, we have to be very careful. And the second point re regarding this question um, about how the Article 6 is connected to other climate finance flows, let's remember that, for instance, in the CDM, 2% uh, of the sales of the, of the emissions certificate went to the adaptation fund. And now in the discussion of the Article 6, uh, we are trying to push that at least 5% of the sales of, of any type of, um, let's say, uh, the, the, any type of uh, benefits that the, that the Article 6 brings, uh, at least 5% should go to the adaptation fund. And this is important for us as civil society, as movements, not only grass movements, but every type of movement, because adaptation is an issue that is more urgent than ever. And it's a uh, it's an area that hasn't received that much attention, and for sure not from the private sector. The private sector has been mainly focused on mitigation, and, and I think adaptation has a very important, um, uh, yeah, needs a lot of support. And, and you know that there are countries uh, that don't agree, well, disagree with this idea that a uh, five percent of this uh, of the Article Six should go to adaptation fund. Some of them want zero percent. Others are kind of negotiating for 15 and i think we have to go uh, towards the the agreement that these two mechanisms are well connected and that will be beneficial because if we don't connect these two instruments then again we will build an instrument that might have reduction um, <laughs> in terms of emissions we don't know because uh, cdm hasn't been very successful on that regard but, but we are not going to be able to at least ensure that that mobilization of resources will benefit adaptation actions that are urgent now. So I think we have to push and all civil society has to increase the, the advocacy in this regard to ensure that the adaptation fund will survive and will have enough resources to, to operate in the future. And we all have to, to demand that Article 6, no matter what, has to respect environmental, social, uh, and of course, indigenous rights and all type of human rights. And we cannot, we cannot accept an Article 6 without this savers. We cannot. If we do it, forget it. Climate change will be accelerated and we all are going to be really, really in the worst conditions because the worst impacts, we will see it very soon or as, as we look in every single day, I'm in the UK and 34 degrees uh, that we have here. So it's happening and Article 6 has to be extremely, extremely exigent with this safeguards uh, in the operation. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be probably the worst scenario. Can, can I jump in? Uh, mm -hmm. Just something in addition to that point. And I think it's very important. And we are, we are very much at the African Development Bank. We're very much in favor of, you know, finding a systematic way of uh, resourcing the adaptation fund. Um, and we believe that the fund can do a lot of work on adaptation on the ground. But I think we also have to expand the conversation into how do we make, develop business-like adaptation projects um, that can crowd in private sector investment? You know, how do we make adaptation, um, you, you know, very interesting for private sector investment? And we are also able to help some of our government to shift away from the notion of grant-based support for adaptation projects. And, and I think that a lot of that thinking is very important so that when we think of private sector in climate change, we don't just think of them for renewable energy programs alone. We don't just think of them for mitigation alone. Can we begin to also expand the thinking around 
you know, developing, uh, you know, bankability um, uh, in, in, in the adaptation space. And I think it's very important so that we don't always think of funds like adaptation funds or grant resources to be able to meet the adaptation demand in our countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I really enjoyed the discussion this far, and I think um, we have time for one last question that I would like each one uh, of our speakers to answer. Um, I think um, based on what we have heard, um, I would like to know um, how can developing countries um, prepare or get ready to tap into the potential benefits from Article 6? and based on this last um, additional um, comment also what what should they what should developing countries do and how um, how can they get uh, ready for attracting more finance not just from article 6 but different sectors just like the private sector and if any what would be the role of the youth to make this happen and to help this happen uh, so if we can start with uh, peter Thank you very much. Because of time, I will I will I will answer one word, and I will start with the youth, because we have not given youth so much prominence because they were the people who we need to. One, uh, we need to have and support youth-based enterprises, which are more combined between adaptation and mitigation as part of the readiness for the realization of Article Six. Article Six will be relying on bankable. When I talk of bankable, it's not to take it to bank. They will rely on projects that will be able to demonstrate business case at the local level. So youth must start now, get uh, to be supported to start thinking of those kind of projects uh, for to tap into the Article 6. Two, we already know the skeleton and the structure of how Article, uh, Article 6 uh, design will look like. It will only be refined, but the general what uh, the general design is already known. If you look at what happened in Katowice, if you look at what happened in Madrid, we have we have a clue. So one African countries must now make their markets ready. The markets readiness means that we have to have the market based policies. We have to have incentives to incentivize the private sector and to lower the alternative sources of finance. In Kenya, for example. We are now working on our green fiscal or policy framework, which will be designed to enable take aspects pro rata of what we anticipate in the Article 6. And just as what Dr. Terry has said of Funso, we are also now not looking to for this long wait of the negotiations. Kenya, we are going to uh, depend now float our sovereign green bond, and we are going to expect a very significant size in December. So that green bond is tailored towards more of adaptation, the economics of the biodiversity, adaptive infrastructure, the forestation, the water tower. So we are now designing and making the market ready. Those ones will now have employment, green job opportunities for the young people so that they can participate with their both enterprises and also at the local level. And finally, we are not waiting for anybody to enable us move there. With the support from the World Bank under the financing locally led climate action, which is taking place at the local level, level. It is the green champions that are now being capacity built, being taken through the processes to start establishing uh, governable, uh, sustainable institutions at that level start getting their management correct, because we know they are, the resources are going to flow directly from the national government to sub-government to the local level. So we want to have those youth which are at the local level to meet with the youth at the sub-national level, and also now to bring them at the national level so that when markets are ready, when the stocks are working, when the resources are being uh, shared, and we have our affirmative action for youth women, then we will be ready for the article six. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Uh, can somebody take, take it up? Sandra. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Dr. Um, Dr. Sander um, Guzman, can you uh, help us with the... I can jump if you, if you want. Continue. Okay. Yes. I think that uh, one was the next, no? Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay, <laughs> whatever. Um, okay, so quickly, my I, what I just want to emphasize is you, you may know that uh, many countries included in their NDCs this perspective um, about the possibility of using a uh, carbon market as a, as a way to fulfill their commitments. Uh, and they mentioned sometimes like, ah, we, we would be uh, willing to, to explore this type of mechanisms. Some of them are actually in play, uh, putting in place pilot programs, such as the case of Mexico. Mexico has just uh, approved last year the creation of, of a carbon market at the national level, and this year it's in the pilot program. Uh, and one of the key discussions in the case of Mexico is like, to what extent the actual um, mechanism uh, at the national level will be connected with a global framework and under what conditions? And I think many countries have to make the same questions, like uh, starting with defining clearly uh, what are the commitments that each of the countries have, what, is, what, uh, what are the areas where, we, the, where they would like to use carbon markets as a, as a way to, to complete, uh, to leverage, uh, you know, the mechanisms to, to deal with, with, um, with climate action. And, and I think it's, a, it's an analysis that has to be very well debated at the national level, because if you know what are the opportunities and what are the risks, you will be in, in a better possibility to discuss this at the, at the global level. And I'm going to tell you why. I have been, last year, I was a negotiator uh, uh, for Mexico uh, in Article 6. And what I noticed is that many countries don't have any idea how, how current markets work, even the negotiators, because they don't have this experience. Countries like uh, in the European Union, in, in New Zealand, uh, obviously, they know how these uh, uh, mechanisms work. So they can bring experiences and they can bring practical um, elements to the discussion. But many countries in Latin America, in Africa and Asia, they don't really know how this uh, work in, in practice. So I think we, have to, we definitely have to um, bring more technical discussion about the real, um, the reality of how this market uh, uh, can, can work. Um, and, and of course, we have to, to always connect the market or whatever mechanisms they are designing with the actual compliance of, um, of, of, the, of the NDCs. But even, even more important, uh, you know that the NDCs submitted so far are not enough, are not enough to, to comply with the Paris Agreement. So we really have to redesign uh, and rethink uh, how far the carbon markets can take us. Uh, and we have to discuss what are those adjustments that we should do at the national level to bring like uh, more um, technical elements to the discussion because I can see that of course it's a political discussion, but I can see clearly that there are a lot of people that don't really have the technical elements to to defend their points and and, and it's a very unbalanced uh, discussion in the negotiation. So I really have to deep and deep and deep the technical discussion to understand better the consequences and, and the impacts and the effects that this will have in the future, no, just, uh, you cannot just bring, um, uh, you, you, you just should bring like a, a full package to the, to the negotiation. And finally, I think definitely youth movements have to uh, be engaged in, um, in a very, uh, in a very, very um, comprehensive uh, perspective, not only the environmental side, the social side, the human rights side, but primarily the transparency side. No, we are discussing the future of the humanity. No, it's not just a mechanism and in, in how effective it is or not. We are discussing the actual future, and we are actually discussing that we are in a state of emergency. So we have to accelerate. We have to be disruptive. But disruptive shouldn't be just without rules. You know, like we have to plan. We have to. And if we if we don't have an agreement on it, so let's don't do it because it's better don't have it that have something that is very bad design. That's for sure. And, and we have as, 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 um, as movements to, to really push for having something that maybe is not going to be the most ambitious in the first side, but will be effective. And then the ambition could increase with the time, but we cannot deal with something that is bad designed and that for sure is going to create more externalities. And for sure, human rights should be for all of us the key element in the in the whole thing, as well as transparency and, and accountability of the of the system. And thank you so much for the invitation. 
thank you very much Anna, for, for the intervention. Um, very important points. And I don't know, Dr. Uh, Fonso Samoran, do you want to? Yes, Th thank you. And um, I, I don't want to repeat the things that have been said. Thank you, Sandra. Um, a lot of the good points that you've mentioned, and I think it's, it's almost like a template for every one of us, whatever region you come from. Now, let me emphasize the role that youth can play. We're in 2020 at the moment. A lot of countries in Africa, especially, are revising their NDC. That revision, obviously, is supposed mm -hmm. to be an ambitious revision, an upward revision. That revision, you must have a lot of people involved. You must have a broad-based participation involving not just the Ministry of Environment in most countries, but also in Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Energy, across the government institutions. Then you also come to within the civil society, academia, private sector, as well as youth organizations. Why is it important to have a broad-based participation in the revision of the NDC or in the development of the you know, long-term strategy, whatever it is? It's important that for every item of that we have in the NDC, we must be able to think implementability in the design. And it's very important that we don't just, whatever target we set for ourselves, mm -hmm. we must be sh sure, we must make sure that we can think of how to implement them. So in the case of implementation of NDC priorities in a particular country, let's say Kenya, it's important that at every line you are able to anticipate which of the approaches, approaches within the Article C will be very useful for you, um, for different sectors and that. And I think it's important, it involves a lot of collective thinking. And, and you know, sometimes you'd say, we don't even know how to get involved. You have to be part of this because you don't also want to repeat the problems that we had. And, and I'm speaking for African countries right now, during the CDM era, where we spent too much time trying to understand what the ca carbon market was. By the time we were getting a sense of it, it was over. So it's very important that we are able to anticipate implementability in all our priority areas. And how do we do that? Well, we must also be able to be sure about what is going to work for us. Countries that have high level of I mean, e e emissions, largely from a follow, from the land use change, they have to be very careful about how to be part of Article 6. I suppose countries that, are can, that have emissions from waste. I suppose countries that have em emissions from fossil fuel. So it's very important that at every point in time, looking into our peculiar realities in Africa, we must be able to anticipate what is going to work best for us. And I think that's what we're going to push. Last point again is, I don't know how we're going to get around this. Adaptation will always be a priority. And from where I stand, mitigation is an opportunity. And the opportunity to contribute to a global mechanism on the one hand, but I also see it as an opportunity to achieve adaptation. So as much as possible in the African context, we must always create energy and complementarity between both. We must not see them separate and too distant apart. At every point in time, when we do mitigation, we must do it with adaptation in mind. At the same time, when we do adaptation, we must do it without compromising mitigation, um, uh, uh, mitigation requirements. So it's very important that we must always look into our context as we're part of this global mechanism. Again, this has been a very, very beautiful conversation. Thank you very much to all of you, and I hope we can take it up after this one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Antoine? So, Ed, yeah, the, just want to echo everything that's been said. Thanks to, to the other speakers. I think, just coming back to your comments, Sandra, I think that no Article 6 is better than an Article 6 that doesn't work, clearly, because it wouldn't achieve much um, and would be very complicated to to implement. So I would echo that point to start with. Uh, the other point that was made as well about countries' readiness, you know, you've got some developing developed countries that are sending um, teams of 30, 
40, 50 to cops and then smaller countries represented by a couple of people. So obviously they cannot be on top of everything and especially not carbon markets, which tend to be more and more complicated. What the final thing I'd say is about, you know, message to the youth is to make an impact now and using, you know, related that point to markets, I, I think there's so many opportunities for the youth uh, to develop projects locally um, and to rely on the independent standards that exist, like the gold standard, Vera and others that have strong MRB systems delivering verified reductions and to get private, the private sector to finance those um, because there is great uh, demand for those. I think that's one way to make a, a really strong impact on the ground and can be tailored to many countries given the variety of projects and methodologies that exist. So that would be my, uh, my conclusion. And um, thanks again for the opportunity to join the, the discussion. Very, very interesting today. Thank you. Thank you, Antoine. Think, Maria. Uh, Maria? Yes. Okay, yes, I just want to re echo uh, my thanks. Uh, we're really appreciative of uh, your time for coming here and also for being very explicative in terms of Article 6 and the climate finance. And I just wanted to say, um, in addition, is that we are working on a uh, uh, Youth Climate Action Fund. So it will, we, we are hoping that the fund will be able to finance youth projects in the areas of mitigation and education. And basically, it's also in line with the fact that we've been uh, getting a lot of um, feedback from young people who have projects, like how Dr. Unso said, uh, those who have projects but cannot find the, 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 the banks to finance them. And so we want to be able to tie that gap to bring those who have the funding to those who are having the projects for specifically youth-led projects. And we're hoping uh, that you would be interested in, you know, reading the concept we're developing and, and helping us, you know, guiding us in making sure in line with the Paris Agreement, but also in line with achieving um, enhanced targets. And with that, I will hand over to Dolphin. Thank you, Maria, uh, for that conclusion. Just to expa expand on that a bit, we, in line of the upcoming Youth Climate Change Fund, we'll also be looking into how we could mainstream it. And I, I know country, I'll speak for Kenya, countries like uh, Kenya at the county level, sub-national level, they have the county climate change fund. So we, we we're also looking how to mainstream this initiative to the grassroots to have a model where we can have a percentage of that fund allocated to youth innovation in issues of climate finance. Aside from that, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers for creating time uh, from your busy schedules to take part in this very uh, fruitful discussions that we've had today. I'd also like to thank our audience who have been very interactive. I know there are more questions that are streaming in. And I'd also like to highlight that we, we have more upcoming sessions. Uh, the next session will be on the second week of August on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the Friday of the second week of August. And we welcome all young people and other stakeholders to come and be part of it. In conclusion, I'd like to call upon all governments across all countries across the globe. I'll, I'll call upon civil society organizations, private sectors, and all other stakeholders to continue engaging with young people on not only just issues of environment and climate change, but across all aspects of the of the globe environment, SDGs, because we need to have a strong intergenerational partnership as we move on into the next decade. With that, I'd like to declare this session closed and thank you for taking time to be with us today. Thank you. Bye.